Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldick, a 30-minute walk through the scriptures teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. Okay, it's good to see everybody in again. And uh, for those of you joining us on television, once again, we'd just like to welcome you to an informal Bible study. And uh, as many of you have already written, you feel like you're sitting back there in the back row, and that's just exactly the way we want you to feel, that uh, it's a learning experience, and we trust you'll do as everybody does here. They have their own Bible and their notes, and uh, we just trust that we can show what the Scriptures say. It doesn't matter what Les Feldick thinks or what anybody else thinks, it's what does the Word of God say. Now again, uh, all our programs, of course, are available on either video or audio or the printed page. But if you're interested in this particular program, this is what this formula up here means. We are presently in our book number 52. And as I said in the last program, this afternoon, hopefully, we're going to finish the book of Hebrews. And it will also finish then book number 52. And uh, we'll be ready in our next taping then to start the little book of James and book number 53. Huh? And uh, where we go from there, we'll just let the Lord lead and direct. All right, but we're, today we're in Hebrews <coughs> chapter 12. Pick right up where we left off at the end of our last program. We were in the middle of verse 23. And I didn't feel like I should just skip the remainder of the verse and go on to 24. So we'll come back into t Hebrews 12, verse 23. And uh, reading the whole verse, remember we pointed out that there were seven things that pertain to the, the physical and the visible aspect of Mount Sinai. And then the flip side was these seven that are associated with our spiritual relationship and position in the heavenlies. All right, so we came through verse 22 where we have come to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, not the earthly one, and to an innumerable company of angels, which is part of the heavenly abode, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which, of course, in Paul's language is a reference to those of us in the body of Christ, and to God, the judge of all. We covered that at the close of the program, how that every believer will come before the Bema seat to be judged for reward, and then to the spirits of just men made perfect. I couldn't just pass that up. We, we, we have to stop with this. Who are the spirits of just men made perfect? Perfect. Well, let's go back to Romans so that we pick up the scriptural account of what Paul is talking about. And we come to Romans chapter 3. <clears throat> Romans chapter 3. And I always like to drop down to verse 23 where we have the what shall I say, the culmination of everything that has been building in the first three chapters here in Romans. And that is the conclusion that all, none accepted, Jew or Gentile, rich or poor, good or bad, doesn't make any difference, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But it doesn't stop there. You move right into the next verse, and here we have that glorious hope of salvation that is extended to every human being, none accepted, and that is that we are justified freely by His grace, His unmerited favor. God didn't have to do this, but He did. And so now we are justified freely by His grace through the redemption or the process of paying our sin debt that is in Christ Jesus, Verse 25, whom God set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood, that shed atoning blood of the cross, to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins in her past through the forbearance of God. Now here's the verse I wanted to come to. Of just men made perfect. How? To declare, Paul says, at this time, His righteousness, that is, the righteousness of Christ, and because He, as the righteous one, 
has finished the work of redemption. He died the death that every sinner should have died. All right. And that he, Christ, the righteous one, might be just, absolutely fair. He's not cutting corners. He's not being paid off. There's no corruption here. But that he may be just and be the justifier of him. Now, that's a generic him. That means men and women, boys and girls, everybody. And that he might be the justifier of him who, what? Pays a million dollars? Crosses the ocean? Climbs Mount Everest? No. To him that would. Believe it. And that's something anybody can do. There are no strings attached. And that's what makes it so simple. That God, the righteous one, who paid the price of redemption for every human being, finished the work of the cross, that he in turn might be the one to justify anyone who believes in that finished work. It's that simple. And oh my goodness, as I use the illustration over and over since we come past Hebrews chapter 1, twice in all of biblical history, starting back in Genesis, twice God did something so perfect, so immaculately perfect, there wasn't anything he could do but sit down to show that it was finished. The first one was creation. And he looked at creation. Everything was so perfect. There wasn't anything he could correct. In fact, I used this example in one of my classes the other night, and I said, how many of you have built a new home, and after you've moved in, you have to call your contractor back to correct mistakes? And I had one guy really nodding his head. Well, he wasn't the guy that had the new home. He was the contractor. <laughs> <laughs> He knew only too well what it was to have to go back and correct little errors that they had made, you know, a cupboard door didn't fit or something like that. But God didn't have to do that. It was perfect. And he sat down. The second time is, as Hebrews places it then, that when he had purged us from our sin, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty. And again, why? Because the work of salvation... The work of the cross was so perfect. There wasn't anything he could do. It was all done. And then what did I put on that? How would you like to have a little two-year-old come along? Oh, I used the example. I'm sorry. I used the example of shining a brass lamp or a brass vase. And you know how easily brass can be tarnished. I said, well, how would you like it if you had this brass lamp perfectly polished? And then have a little two-year-old come along with his hands full of jelly and smear it up. Well, that's what man has done with God's perfect plan of salvation. They have smeared it all up with their additions of do this and do that. How it must break the heart of God when he has made it so available that no matter who it is, no matter how vile or how steeped in a false cult they may be, the moment they believe in that finished work, God, what? Justifies them. He declares them just. He declares them righteous. See? Oh, that's beyond human comprehension. So I don't expect people to understand it. Believe it. God will take care of the rest. Just believe it. All right? So now if you'll come back with me to Hebrews, and maybe that verse will just jump off the page at you the next time you see it. He's the judge of all and the spirits of just men, righteous men. That's what the word just here means. Of righteous men made perfect. That is in God's eyes. Not in the eyes of men, but in God's eyes. The righteous judge. All right, now then let's move into verse 24. Numbers 6 and 7 of these seven items that are in the area of the spiritual now instead of the physical. Verse 24, and to Jesus the mediator. There's the sixth item. 
It's in the realm of the spiritual. It's not a physical mountain like Sinai. It now, it's not thunder and lightning and the voices that they heard. But these are things that we take by faith. And so the fact that he is now the mediator of this new arrangement, this new covenant, as he uses the word here, or a new testament is the word we're more accustomed to hearing. All right? The mediator of the new covenant. Well, we've used it before. Let's use it again. Come back with me to Timothy. First Timothy. Because I, I prefer to let the Scripture do the talking. <clears throat> First Timothy, chapter 2. Oh, my goodness. Uh, I think I'll just start with verse 1. So we pick up the flow. Uh, I don't like to just jump in on one verse if I don't have to. Let's just start in chapter 2 of 1 Timothy with verse 1. And this, of course, is Paul admonishing his son in the faith, Timothy. And so he says, I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, see, that's why I'm always stressing here in my class in Oklahoma, you pray for that president every single day. You pray for it. The Scripture instructs us to. We're to be praying for kings and all that are in authority. And the, the end result is for our own pursuit of happiness, as our Constitution, I think, puts it, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty, Verse 3, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. This is all in accord with His will. Now verse 4, who would have all men to be saved, God not willing that any should perish, who would have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. All right, for there is one God, one, not several. Don't you believe this old hogwash that you can pick and choose and take your own way? There is one. Now someone referred to me one time up in Minnesota that he appreciated my teaching an exclusive gospel. Well, at first I didn't know what he meant, but I do now. And when I say exclusive, I mean there is no other. The Scripture is full of. There is no other name given under heaven among men whereby we must be saved. Paul says in 1 Corinthians, For I have laid the foundation. There is no other foundation but Christ Jesus. All right, now here it is again. There is one God, not several, and there is only one mediator between us and that God. One mediator, not many. There is one mediator between God and men. And who is it? The man... Christ Jesus. Now remember, as we've even come through Hebrews, Paul has been stressing the, the position of God the Son. The Son. But He was man. He was human. He walked. He talked. He ate. But He never stopped being God. And as such then, He can be the mediator between men and the invisible God. All right, so... Read it again, verse 5, there is one God, one mediator between that one God and men, and it's the man Christ Jesus, which, of course, comes back to the fact that as a member of the Trinity, God the Son is just as much God as God the Father, and uh, in their triune headship, they are one, but nevertheless, Jesus the Christ is the mediator between man and God. All right, back to Hebrews chapter 12 then. And so this is one, another part of the seven attributes here in the spiritual realm that he is the mediator of the New Testament and to the blood of sprinkling that we all already saw referenced in uh, Romans chapter 3 that it was that blood that was the price of redemption that had to be paid for the satisfaction of our sin debt. All right, to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh, now here's our Hebrew word again, what? Better. 
the blood of Christ is far better than that animal sacrifice blood of Abel. Now, I hope you haven't been misled in Sunday school or any other way that the comparison here is between the blood of Christ and the blood of Abel, who was murdered. That's not what it's teaching. That has nothing to do with it whatsoever. What we're comparing is that the blood of Christ was so far better than the animal blood that, of course, was used of Abel. And that's as it had to be. Animal blood was the uh, requirement in the Old Testament economy. Now remember, just back up a page or two and we'll see how God was satisfied with that animal sacrifice offered by Abel. And that's in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 4, honey. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 4. <clears throat> Just back a page, hopefully. Hebrews 11, verse 4. By faith, because this is what God instructed, and that's what Abel did. Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. Now, we are not going to take time to go back to Genesis, but why was Abel's more excellent than Cain? Abel brought the firstling of his flock, which implies, it doesn't say it was a lamb, but it implies that it was a lamb. Maybe a goat, but I prefer to think it was a lamb. Whereas you see Cain brought of that which grew out of the ground, a bloodless offering, and God rejected it. All right, so now the comparison is here, the blood of Christ is so far above the animal blood of the sacrifice that Abel offered because of what God has now done, see? All right, now let's look at it and then we'll move on. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 24. And so to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, because of the blood that he shed, the perfect Lamb of God. And it was far better than the blood sacrifice that Abel offered. All right, now let's go on to verse 25. Now this is a warning. Now remember who he's talking to. These verses are written first and foremost to Jews who were having a hard time breaking away from Judaism. He's not talking so much to us Gentiles. As I said at the beginning of the study of Hebrews, this is almost to, I don't like to say exclusively, but primarily, that's a better word. This is primarily to Jews who were fighting the battle of making the break from legalism and Judaism and the temple worship. Remember, the temple is still going and to step out of all that into this glorious age of grace. All right, that's the whole purpose of the book of Hebrews. But as we've seen now in the last two years, there is so much for us to learn. My, I've learned. I hope you have. My, I've learned as I've prepared these lessons out of this book of Hebrews. Even though it is not directly written to me, it's written to Jews, yet oh, how we learn. Well, you see, we study the Old Testament on the same basis. The Old Testament isn't written to us. When the Old Testament speaks of sacrifices and, and uh, offerings and meal offerings and so forth, we don't do that. But we certainly learn from it, and that's the purpose. Well, the same way in the Gospels. Our Gospel of grace isn't in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You can't find it. Does that mean we throw it away? No. My goodness. We can learn so much of, of Christ's compassion and of His power and of His miracle working. But that's not the plan of salvation. It's just simply things for our learning that prepare us then for this apostle of grace who brings out then this glorious gospel of grace. All right, so now in verse 25, the warning is to these Jews to these Jews who were having a hard time making the break. He says, see that you refuse not. Now let's put it the way we normally would say it. See that you do not refuse him that speaketh. For if they escaped not, 
who refused him who spake on earth, much more shall we not escape if we turn from him who speaks from heaven. Now, the casual reader just go right over there and not have a foggiest notion of what was talking about. But what's he saying? Do you know that when God was dealing with Israel in the Old Testament economy, and Israel would just simply spurn God and they would go on their own way, they'd go into idolatry, what did God do? God judged them. When they went into the depths of idolatry, he sent old Nebuchadnezzar from the east, and Nebuchadnezzar destroyed the temple, the city, and the, the nation was uprooted, taken captive all the way out to Babylon for 70 years. Why? Because his wrath fell upon a disobedient people. And over and over, God would do that throughout Israel's history. And he was speaking with them while they were, you might say, his objects of affection and everything on earth. But now we're under a far greater responsibility. Now read on. If they escape not who refused him who spake on earth, how much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him who speaks from heaven? Now you've got to look at the big picture again. While God was dealing with Israel in the Old Testament, there were a lot of things that they didn't have going for them that we do. For example, they didn't have the indwelling Holy Spirit. They didn't have that benefit. All they had was that table of law set in stone, and all it could do was condemn them. And then they had the sacrificial system, which wasn't always that easy to keep. But nevertheless, they didn't have a lot of the advantages that we have today, and yet God held them responsible. God punished them when they turned in unbelief. All right, so now the comparison is, if God would punish Israel back in those days when they didn't have all this going for them, how much more will his wrath fall on these who reject him as he speaks from heaven? Now, when we say he speaks from heaven, let's come all the way back so we get the big picture. I, I, I have to keep looking at that. You can't just pick and choose. We have to look at the whole scenario. Back in Acts chapter 1. In Acts chapter 1, he has just finished his 40 days after the resurrection. He's been with the 11. And now they're on the Mount of Olives and he is about to ascend back to glory. The Father is now beckoning him to come and sit at his right hand. All right, so look what it says. Verse 9, Acts chapter 1. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up. Now we're speaking of Jesus, of Nazareth, the crucified, resurrected Christ. <coughs> he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven. Now you got the picture? He's leaving earth, and he's going up to heaven. And as he went up, behold, two men, angels, stood by them in white apparel. And they said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven. That's what I want you to see. So where is he? He's in heaven. And from this point on, whenever he speaks, he speaks from where? From heaven. That's obvious, isn't it? All right, now then the Apostle Paul constantly is letting us know that that's where he got his marching orders, from the Christ in heaven. Let me stop while you're still in Acts. Let's jump over to, oh, let's see, chapter 22. Chapter 22, this is just an example of how Christ spoke to him from heaven. Acts 22, and drop in at verse 17. 
Acts 22, verse 17, And it came to pass that when I was come again to Jerusalem, even while I prayed in the temple, I was in a trance, and I saw him, Jesus, the Christ, in heaven. And I saw him saying unto me, Make haste, get thee quickly out of Jerusalem. They will not receive thy testimony concerning me, and so forth. All right, just jump across the page to chapter 23, verse 11. Chapter 23, still in Acts, verse 11. And Paul is under all the pressure now from these hateful fellow Jews. Verse 11, The night following, the Lord stood by him and said, Be of good cheer, Paul, for as thou hast testified of me in Jerusalem, so must thou bear witness also at Rome. Where is he speaking from? From heaven. See? All right, now then you come all the way up and uh, stop with me at Galatians. Galatians. Chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1. And again, he's rehearsing his experience on the road to Damascus. And he's letting us know that everything that he's writing now in these Pauline epistles come from the ascended Lord who is in heaven. Galatians 1, starting at verse 11. Galatians 1, verse 11. Now, all I want you to see is when Hebrews says how that m so much more responsibility is upon us of this age of grace because he's speaking from heaven, but through the apostle. All right? Verse 11, I certify you, brethren. Galatians 1, verse 11. Now, I've only got one minute left again. I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man, for I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, that is, by men. But how did he get it? By the revelation of Jesus Christ. From where? From heaven. See? And so everything, now come back quickly to Hebrews as we close out this half hour. Hebrews 12 again, verse 25. So if they escape not who refused him who spake on earth, much more shall we not escape if we refuse him who speaks from where? Heaven. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the Scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, 30706 West Lona Valley Road, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552. Or call 1-800-369-7856. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Feldick.